My role here today is um, as co-moderator for the first panel discussion, that being digitalization, the multi-stakeholder approach. Hot off the press from the digital 2021, the state of the internet report are these statistics. Social media users have grown at the fastest rate in three years to 4.2 billion, up 13% year on year. We now spend 42% of our waking time online with the average internet user clocking up almost seven hours a day on the web. 5.22 billion people use a mobile phone. 77% of internet users indicate that they buy something online. And older age groups are the fastest growing segments among some of the top social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, etc. What does this have to do with digitalization? The growing use of digital devices has heightened the demand and the need for digitalization. My name is Rabindra Jagannath. I am a director of the TTMAG, Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, and I actually have the pleasure in carrying you through the first panel discussion, digitalization, the multi-stakeholder approach. Co-moderating with me is Sanjay Bahadur Singh. Sanjay is also a director of TTMAG. And our panelists, Peter Davis, Maria Daniels, and Sean Rock, whom I will introduce um, in a short while. What is digitalization? Digitalization is the use of digital technologies to change a business model and provide new revenue and value producing opportunities. It is a process of moving to a digital business. Digital technology has revolutionized almost every aspect of this life, as said by the, um, the minister, as said by the previous speakers. Office work, shopping, music, movies, television, photography, travel, transport, long distance communication are just some areas that have been transformed. In Trinidad, like many parts of the world, the COVID era has resulted in an acceleration of digitalization. We are forced to use digital technologies for areas such as education, healthcare, commerce. But are we benefiting sufficiently? For example, across the public sector, there are various forms of digital transformation taking place at different stages of progress. Part of the driver for this is that the citizens now expect a level of service akin to what they receive from private companies. Speed, usability, availability, and reliability are key. In the private sector, companies are looking for innovative ways to use technology to improve their processes. The internet, a catalyst or facilitator of digitalization, is open, distributed, interconnected, and, trans and transnational. In the internet area, as in other areas, the multi-stakeholder approach is widely accepted as the ultimate, as the optimal way to make policy decisions for a globally distributed network. One of the current challenges in taking forward a vision for digitization of Trinidad, for Trinidad and Tobago is understanding where and how to engage with a range of different multi-stakeholder processes and policy-making efforts currently on the way. Given the growing importance of the digital economy and the ever-expanding technology landscape, there has been a proliferation of efforts that have the potential to shape policies, governance models, and infrastructure investment priorities. But it is often difficult for many stakeholders in the public and private sectors to identify and focus on these processes with the highest potential for transformative, transformative impact. Which brings us to our first panel discussion, digitalization, the multi-stakeholder approach. We have someone on the panel representing the private sector, someone representing the public sector, and someone who can provide a developed country perspective. And in this regard, and largely because I've said too much already, we will just move on to the panel and give each panelist just about five minutes, really, to talk to the topic and thereafter, we throw it open for question and answers. 
First of all, I would have to call on Peter Davis. Um, I have the good fortune of having um, connections with all of the panelists in some form or fashion. Peter is the principal of Peter Davis and Associates, a management consulting firm specializing in IT governance, security, and audit. And I should say a management consulting firm in domicile in Toronto, Canada. Prior to founding PDA, um, Mr. Davis' private sector experience included stints with two large Canadian banks and a manufacturing company. He was formerly a principal in the information systems audit practice at Ernst & Young. In the public sector, Mr. Davis was a director of information systems audit in the office of the provincial auditor in Ontario, where he had oversight audit responsibilities for all Ontario Crown Corp corporations, agencies, and boards. A 30-year-old um, 30 year information technology governance, audit, and security veteran, Mr. Davis' career includes positions as consultant, security administrator, security planner, and information systems auditor. And it's interesting to note that Mr. Davis, um, despite his longstanding, let's say, foray into information technology and management consulting, is currently pursuing an LLM degree at the University of Toronto, a very ambitious person. So Peter, let's hear um, from you some introductory remarks um, and then we'll hear from the other speakers and then we'll throw it out really for questions and from the, from the wider audience. So Peter, over to you. Yeah, thanks Danny and thanks everybody for having me speak. Uh, Normally, when I've gone down and done some work in Trinidad, it's never in the winter. Now I get an opportunity in the winter and I can't go to Trinidad. So, you know, how's that working out for me? I just wanted to bring up some issues to talk about that you people should consider for the next two days as you're attending this conference. So let's just set some context. You know, we heard that uh, Per Kumar give us some history around um, the Internet. But think about the genesis of it and how how the internet sort of evolved, like uh, the way the coral grows, it, it builds upon itself, builds upon itself until it becomes too brittle and breaks off. And so now we're trying to go back and retrofit something to something that's sort of grown organically over time. And that's not always easy. I'm sure you've heard the expression that the only reason God could create the world in six days was that there was no installed base. So we're dealing now with installed base that we have to go back and try to retrofit. The other term, term that we've sort of thrown in here is this concept of uh, multi-stakeholder. So first we have to identify all the stakeholders and then just, uh, determine what would be their, their input into this process. So, you know, I don't envision that we all stand around in a circle holding hands and sing uh, Kumbaya. You know, the world just doesn't work that way, but hopefully we can come to some meeting of the minds. Uh, Danny mentioned a, a very good paper from the Internet Society, and if you haven't read the one about the multi-stakeholder, I suggest that you, uh, you do read it. In there, though, it talks about three pillars or three components, and I hope that in the next two days and even in this session that we have an opportunity to talk about the three components. Um, there will be somebody probably talking about the, the cultural part of this, which is very important, and, uh, and that's really the human aspect that you have to develop your your, your own talent, and you have to, to educate uh, the people with respect to digital concepts and how to do digital. But the hardest part is uh, the digital culture, developing the digital culture. And as uh, uh, WAG many years ago said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So, you know, it's not an easy thing to develop that culture. The next thing that I'm reminded of is part of it, and it was emphasized to me this morning, was this concept that we have to build out the infrastructure. And I, I don't know if the rest of you saw it, but up on my screen, it popped up that the first speaker was suffering from low bandwidth. And so if you want to develop a, a digital society, then you have to build out the infrastructure. I was, uh, I was shocked the other day to see that the US's implementation of 5G, the rollout that they are proposing, is actually has less capacity than our 4G or LTE in Canada, because I would have thought they were light years ahead of us because they keep telling us that they're the best country in the world. But at least in this aspect, Canada is outshining the US. The next component that you need to think about is the whole concept of the, the governance. 
need to build that ecosystem to be able to support, you know, the initiatives that we're talking about. And that is not the is not easy to build out that, that decentralized governance institutions within your country and then how your country will interact with other countries. So last thing, I think I have a few uh, moments left. Um, the challenges that I see that you need to address in the next two days, and, and we could address it uh, starting with this session, are first off, we have to look at nationalism. So between your country and my country, we've seen a lot of nationalism going on for the last four years. And we saw something in Canada this week we found very disturbing where the U.S. Uh, and is engaging in nationalism again, and they're killing off the uh, what's called the Keystone Pipeline. Now, it's not a lot of jobs, but, but still, it was done unilaterally by the United States and is affecting the uh, economy of Canada. We even see that uh, companies like AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, is taking uh, the government, the U.S. government, to task because they awarded a contract to Microsoft, which was a very, ten, a very big contract of $10 billion. And uh, the, the, the argument is, I'm gonna read this, that it was flawed and politically corrupted decision. So if people are making decisions that are politically in, uh, you know, flawed or incorrect. The next thing that I think you should think about as we go through these two days is the 26 words that created the internet. And so in the United States, there's something called the Communications Decency Act and section 230 are, specifies those 26 words. And if you haven't seen the 26 words, then I suggest you look at them and, and think about what they mean. The next thing I'd like to talk about, or we should talk about, is this concept of net neutrality. Now, Canada has something that we have called the CRTC, which we use to regulate uh, telecommunications in Canada. And uh, in there, it, it specifically says that we will be net neutral. Whereas the United States talk about it, they beat their chest, but then we see that they're going to do things that are not net neutral. Now, in some ways, I'm sort of on side with them because I think if somebody wants to spam me, then they have, should have a lower priority when sending me email than my sister Nancy in Vancouver, right? So I think there should maybe be some sort of, of uh, tariff supplied. But again, that could affect the economists. We need to think about it. The bigger question, I think that nobody really wants to address are things like Facebook and the rest of the FANG. I don't know if you know that term FANG, which is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, which everybody seems to be going after these days, is this concept of some of these a public good? Are they serving a public good? And if they are a public good, then you know, common law in your country and mine and, and all the common law countries states that there is this concept of eminence domain which means that somebody could come along, a government could come along and, and basically take them over. Another thing we have to consider is censorship. So we're seeing a lot of that, uh, especially around all the trolling and the propaganda and everything that's been going on for the last four years. But it, it's been going on a lot longer than that because you know, we even saw that Google put out a uh, paper that uh, I think it was last October that they did their own analysis and found out that 64% of the people who joined extremist right-wing groups on, in Facebook uh, were actually recommended to do so by Facebook. So consider that. So somebody's on doing something at Facebook and they're obviously leaning to the right. So uh, Facebook pops up on something and says, oh, you, you might want to join QAnon. So then somebody joins QAnon and then when they're on QAnon, it might, it might be, oh, you want to, might want to join Proud Boys. You know? so, they're getting sucked into it by the platform itself. So where do we start and where do we end with this concept of, uh, of uh, censorship? The last thing I just wanna briefly talk about is this concept of privacy. So countries around the world need to decide whether we're gonna deal with privacy with respect to property laws or we're gonna talk about privacy with respect to liability laws. The Americans have decided that they're gonna deal with it with respect to liability. So if your information is breached, your personal information is breached, then you might be able to sue to recover some loss. Whereas a lot of other countries are considering, no, it's a, you know, it's a, we should be using property rights, like we would use intellectual property. So I own the property, I own my personal data and I can sell it to you. But if there's a, again, it's a difficult uh, concept to, to, to deal with. And it's not an easy solution because we go from one extreme where we have you know, no privacy, uh, to the other extreme where we have very strict privacy. 
And if we have no privacy in place, then what happens is people don't tend to offer data. So think about Facebook. If people said, well, I'm not going to put it, post anything to Facebook, then what value does Facebook have? On the, on the other hand, Facebook wants to use that information to sell you information or to provide that information to other people. So somewhere in between there, we're sort of in this uh, you know, Goldilocks, Goldilocks and the Three Bears situation where we just need to find what's right. And again, the, what's right is what serves the individual as well as the better you know, the, the society at, at large. So I, I think I've given you some things to think about in the two days and maybe some, uh, some thoughts for questions. Good, Peter, and you've given um, our panel and it's still some things to think about because when we have a questions and answers, um, certainly even the Q&A session, um, some of these things will come, up, come back up again. And we look forward to you further ventilating on these items. Our second panelist, Maria Daniel. Maria is a partner in the strategy and transaction practice at Ernst & Young, based in the Trinidad office. She has led several high-profile engagements and has provided clients with advice on raising both debt and equity capital, as well as strategic options analysis towards maximizing shareholder value. She specializes in business valuations, transaction support services on both the buy side and sell side of the transaction, mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures, independent business review, receiverships, restructuring, strategic advisory services, including digital transformation and turnaround advisory. Maria is a chartered financial analyst, holds an FCCA designation and a BSc in economics and management from the University of the West Indies. Maria is also a licensed trustee under the, bank, under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act of Trinidad and Tobago, and has worked in several different sectors across the Caribbean not limited to fintech solutions, strategic advisory services, evaluation services, IFRS 9 implementation, receiverships, and also assurance support. She also works with entrepreneurs to develop business plans and models for new expansion projects. And recently, she has been focusing on developing digital strategies for clients. Maria, can we hear a few introductory remarks from you? Morning, Welcome everyone. On. So, you know, change really only occurs when remaining the same is more painful than the change itself. And we've seen that with COVID-19. But when I think about, you know, all the discussions we're having and listening to, to our initial speakers, we tend to focus on the nitty gritty when we talk about multi-stakeholder. And everybody has a role, everybody has to play that role but what is that role all coming together to achieve? So when I talk about digitization and I talk about digital strategy with my clients and I talk about transformation, let us understand that digitization is an enabler. You first have to have a vision. You first have to have, what am I trying to achieve by going digital? I see a lot of people doing digital things. They have an app, they have a, online application, but end to end, they are not digital. So I have many people going on my online store, but I haven't changed my supply logistics in order to deliver my products. So when we're talking about multi-stakeholder and we can look at the macro view, what are we all trying to achieve? What do we see as a digital nation? How is our education, our education going to change? How is the workforce going to change? What are these skills that we really need? Now, unless we have one big vision that we're all working towards, we can have every stakeholder doing something. We get everybody playing their part, but what if their part is not sharing the same vision or the same strategy? Then what we're gonna have in cell is a multi-stakeholder chaos. So I think what we need to think about when we're talking about multi-stakeholder we first have to start with, what are we all trying to achieve? Where are we seeing this going? And then who are all the parties that need to play and be accountable, a word that you know does not really um, work in Trinidad sometimes, accountable for your part. So I would like us to really discuss and look at you know, the broader picture of, this is where we want to go. 
most of the technology we're talking about today, and I'm sure Peter could, could attest to this, didn't just exist one year ago, right? Everybody, the minister spoke about Estonia. Estonia took this leap 20 years ago, two decades. They started to visualize that they wanted to be a digital leader and they put everything in place to get there. So when we're talking about multi-stakeholder, and I will bring that down even to the corporate organization. Your IT people cannot decide we're going digital and there will be success. Your business people have to sit your customer serving, your supply logistics, your IT all have to work together towards how are we using digital to differentiate ourselves? How are we using digital to execute our strategy? But we first must understand what is the strategy? So I think when we start speaking about multi-stakeholder, it cannot be multi-stakeholder in your own little silo. So more and more businesses want to see the return on investment from in, you know, we could buy all the laptops in the world, but if people don't know how to use them, then it's going to be wasted money. We could, you know, when we think about, you know, where this could go and really using digital to maximize value, it can go very far. But each person has to understand what are we trying to achieve? You know, I did computer science. I wouldn't say how long ago, but very long ago. So much so it was probably the first, in the first two years that computer science was actually offered in our schools at an O and A level. And I'm listening to my daughter who is now doing it in form five. And it's exactly the same thing I learned 20 years ago. Well, more than 20, but that can't be right. So here we are talking about a digital nation, but our education and our curriculum is not changing for how the world is changing. So I want us to think about not only us, you know, being multi-stakeholder, but multi-stakeholder working towards one vision, one strategy with accountability for each of the levers and responsibility being clearly, clearly understood by all parties. Otherwise, we are going to have chaos and we are going to have levers that are not moving together to the bigger whole. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and I love the panel because, as you said, Danny, we have a wide cross-section here of these multi-stakeholders. You have a wide cross-section, you're right, and we have a lot to do, basically, to create the, the, the framework and foundation for the discussions over the, the next two days. Thank you very much, Maria. Our next panelist is Dr. Sean Rock. Um, Sean is the chairman of IGOPTT, um, so certainly qualified to actually talk on this panel. He's a distinguished lecturer at the University of the West Indies and Augustine campus in electrical and computer engineering. He has co-authored numerous articles for various publications, including books, engineering journals, such as the Western Journal of Engineering, presentations and workshops at conferences, both regionally and internationally. His career started in teaching mathematics, physics, and being the network administrator at a local college. He subsequently embarked on his academic pursuits that led him to complete his BSc in electrical and computer engineering at UE, graduating at the top of the cohort within the faculty. His keen interest in information and communication technologies led him to read for a master's in communication management with a focus on government policy and management of ICT implementation in the UK, and then a PhD in electrical and computer engineering in the US focusing on next generation spectrum management for emerging wireless technologies. Throughout his academic pursuits, Dr. Rock has been the recipient of numerous scholarships and awards earned by his exemplary, exemplary work. He's a member of and has been a reviewer of various publications for the Institute of Electronic, Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, and he's also a member of IEEE Communications Society the ACM Association of Computing Machine Machinery, and has been a motivational speaker for the Heroes Foundation. Sean, can we hear a few words from you before we get into the Q&A session? Good 
is on mute. You're on. Okay, Sean, you're on mute. Sean, you need to unmute. I'm sorry. Number one I'm sorry. sentence. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, thanks again, Danny, for that. I thought it was unmuted, but it, but um, there's a delay in the software on on my very aged platform. But never mind that. Um, thanks again for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Um, I listened very well to all the contributions that everybody has made so far on this panel, as well as in the welcome address and the uh, the. Um, addressed by the minister, and I have to say that first, I I wholeheartedly agree with everything that has been said. So I'm going to keep um, what I have to say particularly short and focus on on on, on, on a, a niche area and only um, sort of be devil's advocate in a sense based on some of the things that have been said. Not that I agree or disagree, but just for the sake of discussion. Um, so I, I listened to one thing that was said by the Honorable Minister, and, and I, uh, she said, we need everybody, we need you all. And I think that is one of the, uh, the basic tenets of, of the multi-stakeholder approach. Um, it has to be about having a seat at the table. Um, but I want to balance that with pragmatism, as, as was already said by um, the esteemed um, other colleagues on the panel, because in order for something to succeed sometimes, yes, everybody should have a seat at the table, I agree. Um, there's an issue of equity and fairness that we need to discuss that comes with the, def the definition of the roles, the definition of that shared goal, that definition of what is it that the particular stakeholders are interested in affecting and are affected by for the shared process, the shared destiny that, that arises, that they are trying to um, work towards accomplishing a particular goal. And I put forward that I'd want to extend the analogy of the there's a seat at the dinner table. I'd want to suggest that there's a seat in the kitchen as well, or a place in the kitchen as well, because the dinner table is more about benefiting from the many things that are going on. But having not the opportunity to participate in the joys and the interaction and the community building and, and, the, and so on that goes on in the kitchen to prepare the meal, the hard work and the effort, I can understand why it is that sometimes people often feel marginalized or they, they question what their role is. And if any of you have ever been in a, a sort of a family gathering, I like to draw on personal experiences in, 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 in making the points. If you've ever been in a family gathering, particularly in a cramped kitchen, the coordination and understanding what dish you're doing, what dishes are being made, et cetera, is very important. So it comes back to the point that the panelists made with respect to um, defining your rules. Now, in addition to this, um, sometimes there's a bit of give and take. So you also hear a lot of times with multi-stakeholder approaches about not being listened to. There is no need, and I think, um, I think it was Peter who said it, there's no need for consensus. There's need for a general agreement. So my question to you is, when you're thinking about the activities for the next few days, what are you prepared to agree upon and what are you prepared to negotiate and what are you prepared to put to the side? Because maybe it's not possible to get everything you want when you are trying to achieve some common goal. Your common goal might be just 1% of the thing that you're doing. And I think this is a problem that is faced um, across the board. Now, another area that hasn't, um, outside of what the minister, honorable minister had said, that hasn't really been, been talked about much. And sometimes I would say um, people get the perception that um, the public sector is a little bit slow to move. And I think a lot of it has to do with awareness. And I believe that I don't want to confuse awareness with transparency. I want to talk about awareness and the point of view of being able, and I think Maria said it as well, accountability. What are we responsible for? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? A lot of the times it's work in progress. Danny, you said it. You said that you recognize there were a lot of things that are going on. Um, the question sometimes is, do people know? How can they be part of the process? I think as well that Maria mentioned the issue of um, of now that you 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 have some some understanding of what you're doing, then how are you going to um, as a group of stakeholders sort of um, move forward? 
And, and that is also part of the, the equation. Now, in giving and in accepting that you may not always agree, you may have to deal with, with structural changes and, uh, and, and issues of governance. I think that that is particularly important when one thinks about the role that the public sector plays in a multi-stakeholder process. Sometimes there's the role of the problem solver, the role of the facilitator, the role of the, let's, I wouldn't want to, I want to separate that in terms of the legislative, the economic and, and so on, the things that only they um, can, can really drive based on how the systems and the institutions are set up. And uh, when you think about it, um, and hopefully over the next few days, I want us to really consider that in many instances, the difficulty or the conflicts that arise that impede the multi-stakeholder process generally derive from something that one or many stakeholders may not necessarily understand or appreciate about something else that another stakeholder might be doing. Now, with that in mind, um, I think those were just some little points to plug in to what has been said already, and I just wanted to throw that out. So I'd, I'd hand back over to you, Danny, at this point, and I welcome any questions and the discussion to pursue. Okay, thank you very much, um, Peter, um, Maria, Sean. Um, Multi-stakeholderism is a word that I came across. Uh, if you look at right, it, it will take half your, um, your, your line. <laughs> so um, it's, that's what we're all talking about. And um, let's have the, um, probably, let's have people see um, who Sanjay is. Sanjay is co-moderating this session and Sanjay is monitoring the um, chat room for questions from um, participants so that we can bring it to the panel. So we have the panel now and we're moving straight into the questions and answer sessions. And a lot of good things have been said. Um, in fact, it's exactly what we wanted from the um, three panelists. You've opened out the topic in such a way that it's actually going to engage a lot of discussion with participants um, and among yourselves. So let me just, well, if you can spotlight the, um, the panelists. To all the panelists, let me just kick off a question. Um, and Sanjay, when I am, I'll, I'll call on you at the appropriate time to actually bring forward the questions from the chat room. Sure, but no to all the panelists, and, and here's Sanjay. Um, Thanks, Sanjay. Sanjay um, is our co-moderator. Sanjay, you want to say, um, just introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. Please. Sanjay Baru Singh, nice to be on this panel with the, those panelists. I look forward to your questions. As Danny mentioned, I'll be monitoring the chat. And should you have any comments or question, feel free to direct, and I will ensure that this channel to our panelists. Thank you. Great. So for all the panelists, do you think that a multi-stakeholder approach is essential to successful digitalization? And if so, why? Very broad question, but it gives you an opportunity to talk about the whole issue. Peter? You want me to go first? <laughs> well, I haven't um, seen you on the screen. <laughs> I, I think any time that you're trying to pull people along, then it needs a multi-stakeholder approach. You need to, to get people involved. Um, as I said a little bit earlier, I think the most difficult thing is identifying the people that need to be involved. And they're not always evident. And uh, some people we think should be involved, shouldn't be, and others we don't get involved, should be. Um, you know, to me, this concept of multi-stakeholder approach, it's like we're, we're pretending that it's a, a new thing, but, it, but this has been around since time immemorial. There's nothing new here. We just need to, we just need to talk to people. And, you know, and uh, get their input like we would in anything. Like we had the Minister Weston earlier, I'm sure when they go out to, to talk about developing laws, they, they reach out to, to people to get input. And I think that's the same thing that's required here. Great. Um, 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 Maria, you were talking about multi-stakeholderism really at a micro level. Um, um, Peter was talking about it at a, a macro level. Um, tell us what you feel in terms of the multi-stakeholder approach is essential to the success of um, digitalization. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? So I'm not going to say yeah and yeah, that's a given. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we have to look at it from is, again, going back to, to what end, 
right? What are we all trying to achieve? And I'm just looking at the chat here and, and there's a, a comment or question. And I think this has been why we have failed in moving forward. And somebody was asking, you know, if multi-stakeholderism is pursued, how is intellectual property individually identified? And why I'm saying this has been the root cause of us moving forward is we always seem to go back to what is it in for me? Not what is the bigger picture. Everybody wants to be the star. So um, the young people might not remember and why I'm going into this is because we are in a small economy. A small economy means that we can't have 10 people doing the same thing. So when Sean mentioned that we also have to understand how's our role, and Peter just said it, who needs to be there? Who is the best in that role? If we have 10 people that can do the same thing, and how do we all understand what we're trying to achieve? You know, when we do team building exercises, sometimes we give a team and we just, each person has a part that they need to draw. And it never ends up being what the whole is supposed to look like because no one knows what the other one is supposed to be doing. And no one understands what we're all trying to achieve. It's the same thing here. So I think we need to get out of this individualism for multi-stakeholder to really be a success. Because we're saying, yeah, we're all working together, you know, but we're all working together for what is best for me, but not what is best for the overall objective. So I'll hand it over to Sean there. <laughs> all right. Um, you know, Danny, I think we need to shift the order of this, you know, because I have to agree with everything <laughs> that is being said already. Um, what, I would, what I would say is, as Maria said, is a no-brainer. Yes, multi-stakeholder. Um, another analogy, if you permit me to um, think about the human body, um, we can't survive if any of the organs or the essential organs are missing, can we? There are some we can survive without, but they do play a role. Um, but again, the whole point of the human body, the doctors, the medical doctors may not agree with me, it's really to keep the brain moving, but the brain can't do anything without the rest of the parts, generally, right? Um, so, so this is where we talk about um, that issue of, you know, your thinking, your intellectual exercise, um, as it relates to, as, as has already been said, what is in it for me? Why, why am I in this? What do I stand to benefit? And, and, and in answering that, as Maria also mentioned, and Peter also mentioned, you really need to think about what is the common goal? You can't think about everything in the bucket. You have to think about the drops that relate to you. Um, I don't want to go into ma a mathematical um, visualization with Venn diagrams, but you don't always have overlapping interests. So it is really key to focus on, on, on what is important um, in, in that respect. And to, to sort of um, throw something else out there. Uh, in terms of, of, of an experience over the last two years, any minister would have mentioned it. I, I don't know how many of you were familiar with the hack TT exercise um, that, that came out. It was really about a, a, a collaboration or a, a, I would say multi-stakeholder engagement involving um, members of the public sector, the ICT community, private sector, particularly in terms of crafting the terms of reference and in mentoring the next generation tertiary level institutions and between you and me i really wanted secondary school as well in it and maybe even primary school but you know it's, it was a pilot um also government ministries divisions and agencies were involved because they had the problems it was about a year it took about a year and change just a dialogue to understand what are the things the different actors want to get out of it and maybe not all actors were included in that 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 pilot but the the, the success to me was in the fact that um, the students got mentorship. The uh, government agencies got proofs of concept on digital services. And, and Maria pointed to the bigger picture in terms of why. Um, but um, get into that, it, it, you know, the activities like this could funnel into, into that sort of activity. At the end of the, of the activity, the students were recognized. The students had, intel had their intellectual efforts um, rewarded and showcased. Um, they are currently being the, um, piloted um, to different degrees with, within the different recipient ministries, divisions, and agencies. The minister referred to employee TT. Those, that was one of the things that was looked at. 
Um, additionally, there was benefit, I believe, I stand to be corrected, but in terms of the initial discussions, um, a lot of the mentors from the private sector it, it isn't only about, you know, corporate social responsibility and waking up feeling nice in the morning. They got the hidden CVs of these students. They got to see what they really could do. They got to see that there are opportunities to draw on these students, maybe by interfacing with academia to solve some of their own problems through those uh -huh. sort of collaborations. And I think that's something that um, you see a lot in many developed countries. And I, I wish that we could see a little bit more of that in, 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 in our part of the world as well. Um, so, so Danny, I'll just hand you back over with that. But I think it, that, that's what it really sits at to me in terms of what's um, the recipe for success. And following on to what you're saying, um, we have to not only look at the, the, the dark side of digitalization. We have to look at the, the, the positives because there are tremendous positives. Um, there are a lot of dark sides, yes, but those things are, can be manageable. And of course, they are better manageable if a multitude of people come together to manage them rather than leaving it up to one individual as such. Danny, if I may. Um, Danny, okay. if I may. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can you, Danny? Um, good morning. Okay, go ahead. I, I just want to, to say that we, I, I'm listening to the conversation and I've listened to the same conversation for the last 20 years. The thing is, Talk about we, we, we. We are the ones to do it, you know. Of course. We are the drivers, but we, I keep coming to the same conversations all the time. And, 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 and Dr. Rock is, is saying he's sitting in a very crucial position. You know, it is not about agreeing with whatever, what everybody else is saying. We are the ones who have to drive it. And to, and to coin both Danny and with George's um, uh, mantra for the last 20 years, we have to have a champion. But who is the champion? Who will it be? Will it be Danny? Will it be George? Will it be Dr. Rock? Will it, who, who will it be? It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's our responsibility. And I'm saying our oh, because I include myself in that because I've been involved in this for the longest while. We have these same conversations over and over again. As somebody new comes into the picture, we start over the conversation. Yep. We are asking non-IT people to champion our cause. And it's not going to work. We have to champion our own cause. What is IGOV doing to, to, to further IT in, in the country? We still don't have IT in, in, in Toko in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. We, don't still, we still have pockets of internet in, in, in Los Bajos and those places. It's the last 20, 30 years we're doing this thing. So, you know, good, good conversation, agree. but let's, let's take it a step further. Okay. I, I agree. I totally agree. Um, and yes, I have been a player um, in this sphere and trying to get... Um, greater uptake in what we now call digitalization for the better part of, of, of three decades. Um, um, let, let's, let's, following on that point, um, before we take some questions um, through um, Sanjay. Peter, um, the issue of champion, is there a champion or is there a, a, an entity that we can actually identify as a champion for digitalization in Canada? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, yeah, it, I would it, say that um, the answer I would have given is I think the government has to lead this. Okay? Yep. And the reason I'm going to give that bad answer is because in Canada, where we see the government help this concept of digitalization is through the programs that it has in place. So one that's very popular is one called the SRED credits, and that stands for Scientific Research and, and Experimental Development. Now it's a tax credit, which means you have to have some revenue, but at least it gives relief to small companies to do innovation. Right? And we also have other tax benefits. So whether you capitalize something or operationalize it when it comes to expenses also has some impact. We're also trying to set up more, you know, like uh, we have a, an organization called the BBC, which specifically lends money to small, you know, uh, innovative companies. Right? So you need to free up capital to support the, the small innovative companies. And I think that has to come through, you know, through re regulations, legislation and government uh, because we can't do it as a, as a company. But can I just say one thing before I move on? I want to go back because it was, it's hidden in that question. And I just wanted to point out and say that, that what Maria Daniel said was, was absolutely correct. I mean, you have to, 
you have to alter your vision before you try to reconfigure your business model. So this is true at a macro level, at the government level, as well as at the, at the organizational level. You know, I, about 30 years ago, I saw a, a vice president from the Toronto Dominion Bank do a presentation, and he used the term that I've used ever since because I thought it was brilliant, and it goes to what Maria was saying. He used the term electronic verify. So what he meant by that is you can cover over your lousy old processes and your lousy old company using shiny new technology, but it's still the lousy old processes, right? So you probably heard the expression lipstick on a pig, rearranging the chairs on the, on the Titanic, paving over cow pastures. It's all the same thing. Unless you actually re-engineer something and do something differently, then all you're going to do is the things you're doing now faster, and that might be more disastrous for your organization. And that's the big difference between automation and transformation, is what yes. Peter's talking about there. Transformation uh, is about completely changing the way that you do things. And, you know, I, I get frustrated as well the same way. We're having the same discussions for the last 20 years. The minister talked about building a culture. And I tell many of the CEOs I work with, they say, oh, help us create our culture. Help us write a culture statement. You don't write a culture statement. You act a culture. You lead a culture. And I think we get too much into, um, you know, democracy is a good and a bad thing. I think somebody said it earlier. We don't need consensus. We need to agree that this is the best way to go. And the leaders need to lead that charge. And I'll give some other examples globally. So in Nigeria, which we know had a lot of issues with corruption, it was their central bank that took the lead on a cashless society. They forced the banks to change their technology. They incentivized people not to use cash. That's how you drive real change. Somebody on the top has to say, guess what? This is just how we're going to do it. We don't want SEA no more. This is how it's going to be done. We're going to give everybody the best teachers because we can now digitally offer that to all schools. But somebody has to take the mantle and say, this is what is best. Get all the stakeholders who need to be there involved and then just do. That's our whole problem. We talk, but we don't do. And in fact, um, I, it's a pity I'm just um, a moderator because <laughs> this is in four points that has been that has been festering for two, three decades um, with me and, and with IT in small little Trinidad and Tobago. But um, I see that the, uh, Albert Daniel has his hands up. Um, let's get a quick statement from um, Albert and then um, move on to some questions through Sanjay. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Chair. Well, first of all, I can would like to uh, congratulate the TT Mag on uh, executing this very important forum, um, the TTIG of 2021, because in this day and age, having these kinds of discussions will play an important part in ensuring that developments move into the direction that they, they need to. Now, uh, in ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, we, we are based on the multi-stakeholder model. We have spaces for business, government, end users, technical community, and uh, country code managers, and so on. So all of the policy that is developed within ICANN for internet is actually based on the multi-stakeholder model. And I have to say that what I've seen is that Trinidad and Tobago has been very effective in playing their part in all of these different stakeholder groups. So, but what we are seeing now is a little bit of a change, which is why I like Sean's analogy of having a seat at the table vis-a-vis -vis having a seat in the kitchen. Because it's one thing to be at the table, but if you're not active in making inputs in stating concerns, then that seat at, seat at the table is not really effective. What we are seeing now is while there used to be good participation in the past, that that seems to be falling off a bit. Trinidad still has seats you know, with regard to government and users, technical community, and so on. But the people who have been working hard, some of them are at this TTIGF, are suffering from burnout. So my question to the panel is, how do you deal with that issue of sustaining enthusiasm for participation in the multi-stakeholder model? Thank you. Good. So 
panelist um anybody Sean, can you to go jump in? yeah i was i was <laughs> getting off the go, I was getting up to go <laughs> because i i was so wanted to kind of um i wanted to answer it but i wanted to to add to um the discussion um before in a sense um because it it sort of it sort of fits in um with what i'm about to say um so in terms of uh, of 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 and this is something from my academic seat that I I, I tend to, to look at a lot and and I, I can't I can't remember who said it earlier but it has to do with a sense of national service it has to do with a sense of understanding what are the things you want to derive benefit from um, before COVID I was probably clocking about um, 140 hours a week working um, of which 100 or so were online there are 168 hours in the week for those who don't know. Um, so I can't claim that I suffer from pandemic fatigue and burnout because it's always been like that. Um, but especially now, I think where a lot of people are, are, are getting into the, the digitalization artificially um, accelerated because of everything in front of us and, and all of the other issues, the human issues associated with it. Um, what helps me, to be very honest, especially in teams is the, the cliche team building, the taking us, a, a, you know, a little lunch meeting, a little, you know, a little time to, 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 to just have a dialogue. Sometimes one of the biggest issues I, I have encountered working with teams, especially in a multi-stakeholder type of um, arrangement is that there's a, low, there's a drift in awareness of what is going on with the different agents. And, 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 and usually when you're knee deep in the execution of something or even in the dialogue leading towards planning for the execution, um, you know, um, it's always good to establish proper lines of communication and, and to really um, maintain those lines of communication. You can't be so busy that you're unable to share information with each other because that communication channel is, is essential to, um, to the, the process. And with that in mind, I just want to, you know, just go back a little bit. Um, with respect to um, the question that John, the comment that John had made earlier, um, I, I do agree that there needs to be a champion. The question of who is the champion, sometimes we, we lump everybody into the same bucket. Um, and, and that's why I say we need to clarify the rules. And, and, and the thing about transformation is it's less revolution and more evolution. So things change. For example, um, does anybody think that um, what is the role that, let's say, a certain random um, state enterprise responsible would the mandate for advising government on matters of ICT? What is the role that they should take in this day and age compared to what it was 10 years ago? Those are the kinds of discussions that need to be had. Those are the things that determine what you can and cannot do. Um, I think that because of the, 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 the need for awareness, and I take it upon myself that that is something that I as well need to do more of. We need to be more aware of what is going on. Work in progress can't remain hidden for one, but also what are we required to do? What are we being asked to do? Sometimes for the sake of the greater good, another term that has been used, you step outside of your bounds and the lines become blurred. And sometimes it happens so many times that you, know, the, you, you tend to lose your roles. So again, that comes back to issues of governance, which comes back to the question of who is the champion and what are the roles of the different people in the kitchen and at the table? And can I just support say, your statement? Just just support the statement. Hold on, John. Um, we've got to give um, a lot of people um, opportunities to talk. To support the statement, Sean, we have to learn from our history in IT advocacy rather than seeking to redo. And every time we have somebody who is the de facto cha um, champion, that person seeks to redo all that has been done in the past, and we don't seem to move forward now. But Sanjay, yes, who you to the chat room? Some Thank questions you. for the panel. There's, there's been a lot of chat um, relating to hmm. education. They've been talking a lot about uh, um, the multi stakeholder process. There are a few comments here that you know I'm, I'm going to go into, but before I get to that, there's a, a um, this is a a YouTube question, and I'm, I'm going to throw it out. It hasn't been directed to any one of our panelists, but what has been the biggest challenge in ruling out e-governance? That's an open question to the panel. I I could I could start. I oh, sure. I, I would say no. I would say um, clarification of roles. 
um, in, in one respect, um, resourcing in another respect. I think um, that, that has a, a, a significant part to play. Sometimes you're bound. As a simple example, um, there was a recent um, committee meeting, I mean recent over the last 12 months or so, um, whereby one of the particular challenges that is faced is the issues of people and resourcing. Um, what can you do to make sure that you are properly equipped with and, and, and are able to retain those individuals or those groups that can assist you or that can encourage the transformation that you need to do? And this is why when you look not, uh, when, you, when you, know, you hear these, these things, I've been hearing it myself, not for 20 years like Danny, but definitely um, for some time, um, you, you know, you, you hear the same arguments as, 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 as John as well pointed out, you hear the same comments and, and what is different. And it's unfortunate, and I'll push this analogy to you. Sometimes it's not for lack of doing. Imagine you had a building. This is a nice building. You've, you've, you've done your part to build it. It's a little bit expensive, but you want to now sell it to somebody. And because of the expense associated with the building, you need to go through some processes to, to allow the bank to finance it for potential clients. Let's just say, right? Now, when you go and you do that, there are some processes to do that. And sometimes we know that those take a long time. Yeah. Let's say, for instance, those processes are sorted out. And, and let's say through digitalization, you can do a lot of those things. Um, even so, Let's say somebody moves into the building, there's the issue of maintenance, especially in the realm of ICT, things change. So while we might have been in a position, let's say, where um, we might have had a certain standing at a certain point on the timeline, over time, that's going to change because technology changes, things change, we need to evolve. So I, I think sometimes that is the thing that we need to look at as to why is it that we feel and we observe from what we see and hear and taste and touch and smell that we are seemingly in the same position every time. I, I don't think that we necessarily are in the same position every time. I think that what happens is that we, we, we do move sometimes, but things need to be maintained and effort needs to be put on ensuring that we maintain that level of status as well. Sean, I want to go one step further. I want to probe you a little more. And I, I believe I could do that. Um, right, Danny, with your permission, of course. Sure. Uh, Sean, judging from you know the comments that we've seen here and your response to that question, for the benefit of everyone here, would you be in a position to help bring some clarity to the role that IGOV TT has in this transformation, if any? Certainly, I, I, I can do that. And I'll try to do it in, in just um, two or three sentences, if possible. Um, first of all, given the mandates that are put on us um, based on the current governance structures, the, the company essentially is tasked, as it relates to certain matters of ICT, to help those in the ministries, divisions, and agencies who can as well as those who may not be necessarily equipped to do so. And what do I mean by that? Um, we are here to, to help with, 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 with the government through advising on matters of standardization and interoperability, for instance, for helping to put those frameworks in place. Um, another thing that the company looks at um, as well from an operational perspective has to do with the building blocks that would allow you to effect a lot of these digital services. So the underlying infrastructure the, uh, um, the various building block services. Um, we've moved a little bit more into, into rolling out certain services such as um, um, government payment solutions to, to, to assist in the development of these services. And, and this is, these are just some of the things that we do. The other side of it is um, as it relates to the other four pillars of the national ICT blueprint. So one area that we were particularly focused on um, uh, over the last um, two years or so has been that of um, capacity building. And that's where the, the hack TT concept came from. Um, because it's, it's one thing to, to, to build out our you know, internal infrastructure to allow government agencies to interact using, you know, using those, those, those infrastructural services, email, et cetera. Um, it's another thing to now um, re-engineer the processes um, to get people to rethink how they do things so that you can 
um, I would say reinvent, but change the way that you deploy digital services. And that was one of the things that we were looking at in this Hack TT pilot. Um, it was really just to get the people talking, to understand that you don't try to take the paper process and put it on ICT, that's not going to make sense. That's one side of it. Um, it so, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted role in that regard. So, you know, um, it's not about, let's say, um, necessarily putting a, a laptop for a student, let's say, as a, as a example that you hear a lot about now. But what it is, is about assisting those as it relates to putting a laptop forward for the students. What are the standards you should use for the laptops? Um, what, are you making sure that you have the proper user requirements specified? Do you have, have you considered some of those things? Have you considered, um, you know, leveraging strategic partnerships or, or, or such? Have you the, the necessary backing to, to affect the procurement process in a, in a, in a clean, transparent um, manner that is beyond contestation? Those are where the, the activities are. Um, but I dare say that, unfortunately, um, Sometimes um, a company with, with, with circa, um, you know, I'd say um, 100 employees or so, um, we are tasked to do many things and that is for the greater good. Sometimes you just have to do it because if you don't do it, um, it's difficult to move to the next step. And if we didn't do those things, then you wouldn't be seeing things like um, TT commute coming up. You wouldn't see things like employee TT, our government payment, um, the chatbot solutions that are being used right now, um, um, assisting and participating in various awareness and stakeholder processes, for instance, the ICT um, roundtable discussions that were had um, at the height of the pandemic, um, and just providing general awareness and support to various people through symposia and, and, and so on. So um, that is it. I think the biggest challenge, however, is that our prime customer is really government. But the things that government do affects the citizens and the businesses, the other stakeholders. So I think that's where um, a lot of the, the blurring happens. How much of, 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 of our role in awareness should focus on, on the citizen facing, the business facing, the, gov the MDA facing um, awareness? And I believe that that is something that we have to work a little bit more on. And I know that we are working on it so that a lot of these um, blurred lines um, uh, 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 hopefully with, with time should be clarified more. It, thanks, thanks for that, Sean. Um, moving on that and allowing others to come one, into the one. conversation, let me just um, hand over to Maria. You have a contribution here? Well, I want to just take this back a little bit, right? And it, it's a study that we did some you know, a couple of years ago on digital governance and where the board comes in and why some things aren't being done. And I want to put it in the context of part of what Sean said there in the end with the awareness. But he's talking about awareness at this level. Let's start with the knowledge at this level. Where there's lack of knowledge, there is fear. And when there's fear, people don't want to do things. So the first thing we have to ensure is that decision makers understand, they don't have to write a program, but they have to understand how technology works and how it can really make the transformation happen. But when you have people sitting down making a decision and seeing lots of chat here about young people, when I have training now or I have discussions, my lowest level staff are involved because they know more about the technology than I do. They know what's happening out there and their contribution is significant. So we need to widen the diversification of the brain that goes into the decision making. We have to ensure that people who are making the decisions have been educated themselves to understand. You can't have a vision if you don't even know what's out there. To understand that if we know what exists, or if we understand what exists, then that help, helps us build a vision and, and even executing it. So I'm seeing everybody here talking about the, the under 30s, etc. Three quarters of my staff are 25 years old. And they sit at the dinner table and they get to share. Sometimes they don't have the experience and I'll say, okay guys, 50 years old, this have some value still, and this is why. 
So I think when we're talking about awareness, it goes two ways. And I think broadening the minds that sit at the decision-making table is important if we really want to see transformation. Good. Sanjay? Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Maria. Thanks for that contribution. Well, let me hand it back over to you, Danny, with this question. And um, this is a question really that piggybacks off of what Sean said, what Maria said in terms of uh, that broadening the scope. So what do we need to do in order to make that happen? So it's very calculated. What would be our next steps? I don't want to take up the floor too much and, and comment, but um, I, I noticed, you know, I, I'll just jump in very quickly. I'll make it quick this time. I think we need to dialogue. That's really it. We need to have an opportunity to facilitate discussion and hear the points and, and really come to some sort of understanding. I, I think that is um, probably in a nutshell what, what we should be doing as the immediate next step. But also to support what Maria is saying, we need to be willing to dialogue. And sometimes, and this is both the public and private sector, so it's no one more than the other. We don't have sufficient will to actually have that dialogue. And in fact, for some people, it's easier to actually not entertain that dialogue because they feel it's too painful because it's not the area of expertise. But let's hear from um, Peter. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to... I have, I have to say something now because, you know, I, I heard what Sean said just recently what you just said, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but talk is cheap it's time for somebody to come up with the Benjamins. And I'm gonna tell you, I've seen so many failed transfer, trans, digital transformation uh, uh, projects in the last few years. And it's because, and George Goldman will love this, there's a lot of technical debt out there, right? And I have clients who are trying now to use the latest and greatest products, yet they still have Windows 2000 server or Windows 2008 service pack one. So there's all this technical debt. We have to, to address the technical debt and spend some money doing that. We have to spend money on educating people. We have to spend money on awareness. We have to spend money. It's all about money. Talk is cheap. I think the time for talk is long past and you need to do something. And I just wanted to, to uh, circle back to, uh, to Albert Daniel's uh, comment about burnout. There's no question there's a lot of burnout. And you see that in a lot of these digital transformation projects where they're given unrealistic de uh, deadlines of like 18 months to put in all this new technology. But I, I just want to mention in Canada today, we call it uh, Mental Health Day in Canada today. And anybody who texts and uh, uses any of the Bell services, Bell will donate five cents to the mental health because there is a serious mental health crisis going on in the world right now. Good. Asanji, yeah. another question? Yes. yes, I do. I have another question here. I'm going to thank um, Denise Aleong Thomas for this question. And her question to everyone is who is going to conduct a needs analysis of each sector? See you smiling, Danny. Perhaps you want to. No, 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 I have to comment. <laughs> So, sorry, what was the question? Anyone? The question, Peter, is from Denise Alon Thomas. Yep. Who is going to conduct a needs analysis of the sectors? Well, again, uh, I think we understand the needs. I don't think you need more paperwork. <laughs> you know, I've done a lot of work for governments. What happens is they do the, they get the report and they put it on the they put it on the shelf, and then two years later, comes somebody comes back and does the same thing, and they put that on the shelf beside the other one. I think the time is to uh, is is now. You need to yeah. act. And and I thought you were asking another question, which was, how are we going to come up with the money? Well, you heard Maria talk about some places that have had fantastic success, like Singapore, and we could pick on Dubai and 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 countries like that who have decided to invest for the future. And so your 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 country as a whole has to invest for the future. They have to do things that incentivizes that to use that word that many have in innovation in companies and in your in, in your society. And you know, you can't do it as individuals or as individual companies. You have to do it as a society. You have to decide this is what we want to be. We want to be leaders, not followers. Yeah. And but it's it's more important what do you invest in? Yes. So so I mean, if you think of how budgets are spend, um, spent, okay. 
we and, and it goes back to the, to the whole question around are we spending it on the right things have we really spent the time to understand the root cause of why we say the same things every year over and over and unless you actually solve a root cause then you never come out of the pain that you were suffering in the first place right so you know it's just like you know all the analogies with the doctor and your body and stuff if you if it's the wrong body part you are fixing then you're never going to be healthy so yeah needs analysis i mean the amount of consulting and i'm a consultant the amount of consulting reports that have been done i'm sure we will have a whole library filled but then what do people do with it right i mean if you look at singapore right lee kuan yew was a benevolent dictator but he has died and his policies have remained that's when you know you have real leadership it's when you are gone what you have implemented continues so what is the root cause yeah. could be our politics but we won't go there so maybe what we need is some 48 30 and 40 year olds to get together and start to lead the change so the, the truth is we do have budgets our budget is not a small budget um, but we don't look at what is the root cause and where this money really needs to go. Somebody just said egos, and that's it. If you have a room of egos, the only thing is a bigger ego and no action. Yeah, can I just uh, like to jump on something that Maria said? I mean, it's so it's so true. It's and, and to go back to what Sean said, if you want to focus on anything in education, Sean at any level, you got to start teaching critical thinking because I exactly. think there's a serious Point problem on. with critical thinking. Point in this on. But to go back to, one of the reasons that Singapore is so wildly successful is the mindset of the, company, uh, the country, right? They, they get it. I mean, I remember I was struck one time when I was in Singapore and I went into a Chinese restaurant and what they had is they had little icons there and each one of the, I and this is very low tech, but very, you know, very high, uh, high utility kind of thing. So they had an icon that was a chicken, pork or pig, and, and a cow, right? And then they were different colors, right? So the different colors, so if you get a red, uh, a red pig, that meant that you wanted noodles and pork. If you got a green pig, that meant you wanted uh, rice and corn, right? So even in their low tech solutions, they're very, you know, very high tech in a way, right? And so you need to start adopting that kind of mentality if you want to move forward and, 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 you know, and compete in today's world. Because there was vision. There was yeah. one man who had a great vision and he thought about it in every little detail. And you hit it right there on the head. Our education creates people who just want to do what was done before. Memorize a definition, but they don't know what the definition really means. I see it in the workplace here all the time. But Maria, the Excel spreadsheet, I say, I don't care what the Excel spreadsheet have. It makes no sense. Common sense. Unless we teach people how to critically think. And again, look, we get any root cause. One of the root causes is our education system. And unless that is changed and we make innovation like math and English, then we're never going to see innovation continuing past our days. It has to become part of the culture. Absolutely. And one of the challenges we have, um, and, and, and this is taking a dig on, on government, is our government is steeped in traditional ways of doing things. And their perspective is they want an immediate return. So I'm actually going to spend or invest in this particular sector. Within a year, I want to see a return on it. It's not like that. If you actually invest in technology, it's, it's actually going to be a long-term investment. You are going to see some short-term wins and so on, but the payback is in the long term. Case in point, Singapore. Singapore didn't have overnight. It took decades for them to get where they are, they are today. But our government right now is very much a traditional approach to actually their operations. Well, hence the reason why we don't have a, a financial manager, an integrated computerized financial management system in our government as of today. Um, hopefully that will change soon, but we actually are so comfortable where we are that it takes a lot of, it takes something significant like COVID to try and jolt us off out of an, what was the normal then into a new normal. Okay, Sanjay, and come on, run some more questions. 
Well, Danny, we have a lot of comments. There's a lot of subscription to the critical thinking. And uh, okay. while everybody okay. subscribe to that, you know, the key bit here is making that transformation to ensuring that that is now manifested into the actions that we take. And this goes back to the point that Maria mentioned before, um, broadening that scope. So the critical thinking needs to come at all levels. And uh, there's some measure for accountability and transparency, which has been highlighted as perhaps areas that we need to pay a little more attention to. So I wouldn't want to go too much into some of the comments, mindful of time. So what I want to suggest, Danny, is perhaps you invite our panelists to make some, some closing remarks uh, based on you know, the discussions we've had here so that we can ensure that we remain on time. We've got 10 more minutes. Sure. And um, probably what I can ask um, as a final question to lead into um, the candidates, um, the um, panelists making their closing remarks, how can we determine effective regulation in a digital world um, using this multi-stakeholder approach. And it brings it back to the topic and it actually will encompass some of your closing comments. So any one of the panelists to go first. Sean, you go. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I thought it was ladies first, but it's Well, right. I could go ladies <laughs> no, first. No, 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 no. I'll be short and sweet. Oh, God. So you want me to take up the 10 minutes and, and leave you with, right. Um, Danny, just repeat the question again, just because um, um, I just want to make sure I clearly answer exactly what it is you are asking again, please. And for the benefit of one or two people who just messaged us that you repeated they had a break. Okay, sorry. How can we determine effective regulation of the digital world adopting this uh, multi-stakeholder approach? All right. So... Um, I think the, one of the key things, and I mean, I said this before in many different fora, and I, I know that it will be a growing concern, and it's not because of lack of progress, it's because even if you attain what you attain, um, things change, and that's sort of the premise behind a vision. It, it's it's kind of over the horizon. So I, I, I think that governance is key. Governance as it relates to who are the stakeholders? What are their roles? What are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to accomplish it? Um, in a nutshell, I, 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 I believe that that, that is key. Um, I've, I've taken on board a lot of the, the comments and I, I, I enjoyed the conversations um, um, so far. Um, but one thing that I want to suggest as well is that communication, that, that communication has to always be there. Um, to me, whether it's the same message or not, that should tell you something. If it's the same message, ask yourself the question, why is it the same message? Why um, is it perceived that the wheel is being reinvented as opposed to maybe um, getting some refurbishment, for instance? Um, I, I, I think that speaks volumes to, to one of the critical elements that, that needs to be had. So um, in general terms, clear and effective communications are key to the multi-stakeholder approach, as is the, the, the governance process, the governance that, that specifies the process and the interactions and the interfaces between the different agents. Good. So Maria, are you ready? Well, the first thing I would say about the regulations is let's not take five to 10 years to get it done because by the mm. time it's done, it's already outdated. So a law that was drafted in 2006 get passed in 2018, 2020, what happens is it's already outdated. So when we're talking about this whole stakeholder approach, it's not just about the content but also having people to push it forward. And, you know, somebody mentioned um, earlier that we have to be the actions of change. So we are the ones, private and public sector, every citizen has to come forward and say, this is the better for me. We go on Facebook to talk about all kinds of foolishness in this country. 
But instead, why don't we push for the things that need to be done to have the transformation? That's our role. We have to be the activists. We have to be the ones that says, this education system is not working for us. We have to push the change, but we all are very complacent. So I think when we, for me, my little pet peeve with the regulations is let's not take five and 10 years to pass it. We need to be more agile. We need to push things forward and we need to do it now. So my message is now is a great place to start. We don't need to reinvent the wheel as Sean said. All we need to do, and we don't need to copy exactly what was done that does not suit our environment, right? We are different. Our makeup is different. Our size is different. What we need to do is look at what works best for our environment and just do it. Good, and we don't necessarily need to reinvent what has been successful elsewhere once it's actually applicable to our environment. Applicable, exactly. Yeah. And, um, Peter? So, you know, as I've listened to this uh, discussion and the things that are coming out of our mouths, I'm struck by a few things. And one is, is uh, you know, yes, the governments in most locations are putting things online, but I don't consider that a, a transformational uh, act, if you want. Exactly. The government has to re-engineer itself and to consider what is its vision for serving the people that, you know, of the countries that, that you and I are both in. Because if we keep doing, I think it was Albert Einstein, you know, doing the same thing and expecting different uh, results is the definition of insanity. So if we keep doing the same thing over and over again and then wondering why we're getting the same results, like <laughs> we're, we're asking for the same results. And I, and I just want to add what you said and Danny said, or sorry, what Danny said and, and Maria said, was that at the end of the day, it comes down to leadership. And it comes down to, as I said before, it comes down to the Benjamins. Somebody has to cough up some money. Right? And I think about, uh, I'm often thought when we have these kinds of discussions, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the old joke about commitment and involvement. And think about your breakfast, okay? So you're having bacon and eggs. Well, the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. We need commitment, okay? And usually commitment is demonstrated by money. Good. Well, folks, um, I actually have to um, thank this panel for the wonderful deliberations. Um, there's so much more to be said, and I have pages of notes as we were talking, um, but I have to understand that I am a moderator, I'm not a panelist. Um, there's so much <laughs> I can say. Um, and a lot of things that you've said, um, Peter, that relates to the Canadian environment actually <laughs> exist in Trinidad but we are not effective at using or utilizing these mechanisms that exist. Yes, it takes too long to pass um, legislation and thereafter put in place the required regulation. Um, the world doesn't stop turning. We have to uh, appreciate that. So to Peter, Maria, and Sean, thank you very much uh, for your contributions this morning. Um, as I said, a lot of what we are seeing here is opening the doors for uh, the other panelists to actually start addressing specific items. And our next session is really related to cybersecurity, which will be conducted by George Gobin, who is actually gaining a name for himself in advocacy for cybersecurity, not only in Trinidad, but within the region. Um, thanks very much to the panelists, and you all have been gracious enough to, um, to join us in this important IGF. Um, and I'll relate um, a point that Albert made. Um, he talked about ICANN and the multi-stakeholder approach. And having attended a few of the ICANN um, annual sessions and so on, I'm amazed that the approach works, but it does. So we have to bear in mind, there are successful entities that have adopted the multi-stakeholder approach and are succeeding with it. The Internet Society is one, um, ICANN is another one. Um, let's learn from them and move forward. So thank you very much, Peter, Maria, Sean, and we look forward to ongoing discussions with you all at some other forum or um, otherwise. So I'll hand it back to Demis, you the... Um...